Good morning. Let us continue to worship by reading from God's Word. My name is Jason, and I lead one of the Bible classes here at FBC. Today, our reading will be from the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 4, 14 to 21. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? You may be seated. Thank you, Jason. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died for us. We thank you for your spirit that gives us the power to know you and to live for you. We pray this morning as we worship in your word this morning that you would change our hearts and make us more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Around the world, uh, people spend $40 billion a year, this is globally, $40 billion a year on uh, self-improvement. $40 billion a year. Whether or not that's a good investment, uh, I'm going to leave that to your own assessment. Things we purchase uh, for self-improvement, um, you know, like self-help books, uh, people attend seminars. Uh, people listen to podcasts and purchase resources from self-help podcasts. We watch videos on social media. We want to learn new life hacks, how to be uh, more effective in washing the dishes or whatever it might be. So this, what, it, what this boils down to is people want to know, how can I change? There's something in my life that I perceive would be better if I could improve it. I would experience personal benefit if something could change. And in some way, uh, changing has proven to be difficult. There, I want to change and, and I made various attempts and, and, proven, and that's proven to be difficult. And I'm willing to pay money to have somebody help me do things differently. In the city of Corinth, the people in the city of Corinth, or at least a small influential segment of the people in the city of Corinth, they want to also seek change, but they're pursuing that change through a very sophisticated and elite thinking system. It's a religious and philosophical a wisdom that is both elitist and uh, above the fray. It's the big time, so to speak. And so this is how they want to pursue change. We want to know all the best things and all the best ways, and that's going to put us on a higher plane of religion, and this is how we're going to seek to change our lives. And Paul is going to make the argument in this passage in particular, he is going to say the power of change, the power of being different, is to follow Jesus in the power of the gospel. And that's what, so look down, I mean, Jason already read it, but it's verse uh, 20 in the passage today, 1 Corinthians 4. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. So he's talking about power. He wants us to understand power. And in fact, that's the title of the message today is Life Changing Power. And, and he's going to make an argument on where is the power of God to change lives. How does that work? How does the power of God work in our life to change? Now, power is kind of a funny thing. So I wanted to give you an example of power. Uh, so there's a, a phrase that's used to describe power, especially as we describe explosive force. And that term is the kiloton. 
the kiloton. Have you heard that phrase before? A kiloton is the energy equivalent to blowing up a thousand pounds of TNT. And for me, that's not helpful. I've never blown up a thousand pounds of TNT, so I, I have no point of reference. So I was hoping someone here had that so that we could do that because that would be fun. Well, now we know what a kiloton is. And so when you measure an explosive force, it's by kiloton. So, uh, for example, the atomic bombs that were dropped on uh, Japan at the end of World War II, it had somewhere between 15 and 20 kilotons of explosive energy. Modern day uh, atomic and nuclear weapons are closer in the range of 500 kilotons of explosive energy. That's a lot of energy. Okay? Now, another form of energy, you know, I know, you didn't know you were coming to science class today. You're welcome. <laughs> Suck it up, buttercup. Here we go. Another form of energy is uh, a rocket. I was thinking specifically of my favorite rocket, which is the Saturn V. Those are the rockets that took people to the moon, right? The Saturn V. And, and so those also have explosive energy. In fact, they've calculated if you were to blow up a Saturn V rocket, which would be cool. <laughs> That has about a half a kiloton. Now that's not very much in comparison with an atomic weapon, is it? It's a very, very small amount. But what's the difference? The difference with a rocket with just half a kiloton of energy is that energy is directional. Because a, an atomic weapon is not going to be useful to deliver a man to the moon. Despite its enormous power, the rocket on the other hand with just a half a kiloton of energy because it's directional, it's going a particular place, is able to deliver three men to orbit around the moon. And that's what we're going to talk about here. The power of the gospel is experienced in life in a particular way. And what the argument is going to be is the way the power of the gospel is experienced in life, the purpose of the power of gospel is for our lives to be patterned after Jesus. That's the power of the gospel, is for living to be done patterned after the life of Jesus. We don't seek to go beyond him. We want to have power to live like Jesus. That's the, the life-changing power. It's the ways of Jesus. Look at verse 14, 1 Corinthians 4. I do not write these things to you to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. So what Paul wants the Corinthians to do is get back to following Jesus. From what they have been doing to get back to making their life about being patterned after Jesus by the power of the gospel. And he sees his place in their lives as a, as a parent. At the end of verse 14 he says, you are my beloved uh, children. And so what he's doing is he's using strong language to correct, uh, to train, and to help them primarily for their benefit. He wants them to benefit from being like Jesus. We covered it quite a bit last week, so we won't cover it again, but look at verse 8, just briefly. Verse 8, just look up a little bit in your scripture there. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. So he's saying here, in your, in your way of thinking, you've arrived because you're amazing. You've achieved some sort of a religious elitism through your philosophical meanderings. And then he corrects them by telling them what gospel living actually looks like in verse 11. Because he says, I follow Jesus. By, he says, we're hungry, we are thirsty, we're poorly dressed, we're buffeted, we're homeless, we labor, we work with our own hands. When we're reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. So these are all things that are characteristics of a person whose life is submitted to following Jesus. So he's correcting them. He's saying, you want your religious life to arrive at some sort of elite, glorious place and you think you've arrived there, you see, you missed it. The power of the gospel is in living like Jesus, which is humble service. And so as a parent, he's trying to correct, he's trying to correct the Corinthians. He's not trying to, notice he says, I don't write these things to make you feel ashamed. He wants an outcome in their life. I don't want you to merely feel bad. He wants them to feel conviction. And he wants them to feel the sorrow of sin. But he, he wants their benefit. He wants them to come back into the place of power in the gospel. He's trying to draw them back. He's training them and helping them. He's being authoritative, but he is not uh, doing it for his personal interest. He's doing it for their best interest. He's not pulling any punches, but he's not doing so to humiliate them. He wants them to find the power of their life being changed like Jesus. Look at verse 15. 
For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I have become your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. See, Paul is different than their heroes that they look up to with this elite philosophical system that they're pursuing to make themselves look good. Paul is the one God used to bring the gospel to the city of Corinth. And so, and so he sees himself as a, a father figure to them because he, he was the one that God used to bring the gospel to them that they might be saved. And, and he says, this means I have a special role in your life. Now, Paul isn't saying that whoever preaches the gospel to you and you get saved becomes your father. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I have a particular relationship with you because I pursued your interest, not my interest. That's, he's, he's contrasting himself with these elite, elite religious teachers which are leading them astray. He's saying, I came to you primarily for your benefit. I wanted you to have new life in Jesus. And that makes me have a special place, or should make me have a special place in your life. I've led you to Jesus. I brought the gospel to you. And so that means Paul is arguing, I have care for you, and, and the teachers you're following, they have no such care. They're seeking their own interests, not yours. Whereas Paul is saying, as a servant of Christ, I am pursuing your interests. Now, the other thing we should make note of, Paul is also saying, as a father, I don't need your affirmation to be a father. He's saying, keep in mind, as a father, I come with some sense of authority. Think of this if, if you're a parent. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I had an occasion to deal with this yesterday. I had a, ordered a new pair of running shoes, and they sent me the wrong ones. They were, the box was right. Um, it said the brand and the style and the size, and they opened them up, and they were size eight and a half women's, which is smaller, smaller than my feet, and they were a, kind of a teal. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, uh, they just weren't really my style. I mean, some people might be into that, but it's like, I cannot run in those shoes. I would get, other runners would beat me up as I'm running by. And uh, uh, so I had to contact the company and say, okay, you sent me the wrong shoes, and they needed pictures and all these other things. I, okay, whatever. Um, at the end of it, they said, now, guess what? You're going to get a survey where you can let us know how this interaction went. And we would love it if we got an extremely satisfied answer on that survey. Anybody ever received one of these surveys? Oh, my lands. Okay, now, think of it this way. I was wondering about this. So you go into your child's room and say, okay, we need to go over some stuff. I listen to how you talked to your mom today, and you talked to your mom in a way, you know, you were kind of lippy. Kind of lippy. And you know what? I want to encourage you to no longer be lippy. I'm sure as parents, this is how these conversations go. <laughs> this is how all my, just very calm and level-headed. And uh, so I want to encourage you to not be lippy. And so I'm going to take your phone for the rest of the day. And, 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 and you could imagine the response from this young person. Uh, you would be uh, better suited to ask them if you could remove their arm. <laughs> I'll take a note, you can have my left arm. You can have my right arm. Don't take my phone, I'll operate it with my nose. <laughs> um, at the end of that conversation, you say, well, I'm gonna go ahead and take the phone because I really want to encourage proper behavior so you're less lippy. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and take your phone. And you're leaving, walking out of the room, and then you stop and you turn back to your child and say, now I'm gonna email you a survey. <laughs> I'm really hoping that as you think about this interaction that you're going to give me an extremely satisfied with the parenting that you have received today. Would anybody send that to their kid? I mean, now that I think about it, that'd be kind of funny. But No, why do we not send that? I'm just going to be honest, because we don't care. We don't care about your satisfaction. We want you to stop being lippy, and the sooner the better. This is Paul when he's claiming this sense of fatherhood. He's saying, on the one hand, yes, from his heart, I want your best for you. On the other hand, your opinion's not the thing I'm worried about. That's, a, that's how a parent operates. I want your absolute best, but don't be mistaken. I'm not here to try and make you happy with me. Uh, this is, he mentions this over in 2 Corinthians 12, 19. It's not up on the screen. This is a game day ad. <laughs> have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. He, in 2 Corinthians 12, 19, he says, oh, you, th you thought we were trying to impress you. 
No, 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 no. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not defending myself before you. I serve God. I am going to serve God by blessing you by seeking your best interest. And that's what he's doing in 1 Corinthians 4. He's saying, I don't want to make you ashamed, but like a father, I'm going to call you back into following Jesus. Instead of following these guides who are going to lead you astray. Verse 16. I urge you then, be imitators of me. So what's the life-changing power he's calling them back to? He's saying, imitate me. Now, he develops this more fully over in chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to get to it later. But he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 1. He gives us the full phrase. He's not merely saying, imitate me. He's saying, I want you to imitate me as I live my life the way Jesus does. So that's where life-changing power is, he's saying, is living your life patterned after the ways of Christ. So when Paul in 1 Corinthians 4.16 says, imitate me, he's not merely saying follow Paul, he's saying follow Jesus, and I'm going to show you the way that shows up in life in real time. Paul wanted them to live like Jesus. That's where the power of of life-changing power comes from. The the philosophical leaders, these elite teachers that they were following, they were calling them to think like us. That's what these teachers would say. You need to think like us. You need to have impressive brain cells and IQ. You need to be able to articulate complicated and interesting arguments from ancient philosophical documents. Paul is saying, no, no, no. We do need to think like Jesus, but it's more than a brain thing. We're being called to the power of the gospel that changes how we live. It's life-changing. That's where the power of the gospel is. It changes us, not merely what we think, but how we, how we live. We might say it this way. To believe the gospel is to, to fundamentally have a desire to live like Jesus. So Paul here is, is, is drawing a line in the sand compared with some religious systems. Some religious systems are merely believe this, think this, and then the gospel says believe this because it will make your life different. To live in faith in the gospel in Jesus is to say I have a fundamental desire to follow Jesus in his ways. That's, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of leaving our life of sin and rebellion is to instead in Christ live a new kind of life. The the power of the gospel where we live uh, like Jesus each and every day. Look at verse 17. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved son, my faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. Not just merely Paul's ways, my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So Timothy was going to come to the city of Corinth if he hasn't already, and he's going to teach them not ideas about Jesus, not ideas about Paul. He's going to teach them the ways of Jesus. How would Jesus have us live having believed in the gospel that our life uh, might be changed. This is salvation where a life like Christ is the expected outcome. So this is the gospel. The gospel says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Like uh, Pat read, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that the one you read? Was that close? Okay. That's the one I'm saying. Thank you for pretending like that's the one you said. (laughs) So Jesus dies for us, but it's not a stationary salvation. So it's out of the world of rebellion into a world of living for Jesus. The, one of the best pictures of this is Rahab in the, in, it, was, it was Rahab in the Old Testament. Do you remember that story? Jericho, where the people marched around the city a bunch of times? And, but she was told if she stayed in her apartment that uh, when the city collapsed, she would be saved. Notice at the end of that, she got saved. The, the city collapsed and she wasn't killed. Everybody in her house was saved. Notice she didn't say, I want to live in Jericho. Did she? No, what's in Jericho? None, death and destruction. Why would you live there? The idea is she's saved out of Jericho to do what? Follow God with the people of God. Cloud of pillar, or 
a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. That's the idea. It's not merely to avoid death. It's I am leaving the city of destruction to join the people of God with, an, with a directional purpose, following the ways of God. That's the gospel. It is wrong to think that the idea of the gospel is, is to trust Jesus and then just keep living like I've always lived. That's, that completely misses the point. The gospel says, I trust Jesus, not merely to be forgiven of my sin, certainly to be forgiven of my sin, but I am forgiven of my sin. Why am I forgiven of my sin? So I don't feel bad anymore? It's a side benefit. Am I forgiven of my sin so that I don't have to experience eternal consequences anymore? Side benefit. Do I have to, am I forgiven of my sin and so I don't have to live with regret and fear and shame? What, what am I saying? Side benefit. What's the purpose of being forgiven? Live like Jesus. Amen. That's where we're going. That's the whole, that's the whole point. Is we're, we're being saved out of this into this. If you don't like living like Jesus, can I just be honest with you for a minute? Well, I have been up to this point. I, nothing's changing. <laughs> If you don't like living like Jesus, you will not like heaven. That's what you do there the whole time. If living like Jesus is not your vibe, that's heaven's whole vibe. Why would you want to go there? But so many people, they want to just pray a prayer to go to heaven. You realize what you do there. You live like Jesus. If that's not what you're into, you're just missing the whole point. Certainly we're safe from our sins. Certainly we no longer have to feel ashamed. Certainly we have, but Paul is saying, no, your religion says just think a certain way. No, no, no. The, the, the power of the gospel are the ways of Jesus worked out in real life. And that's what he's calling them to. And this is what he says. I want to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Look back up again, if you don't mind, at verse 11. These, what he's describing here in verse 11 is the way, the ways of Jesus are showing up in his particular life. They're not necessary, but they may be what happens. He says, to the present hour, we hunger and thirst. Did Jesus ever hunger and thirst? Wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water. What does the Bible says? At the end of the 40 days, he was hungry and it wasn't the little you know you wake up and you're like okay I had a bunch of pizza but I could use more pizza <laughs> this was the I will eat I will kill something and eat it right now <laughs> kind of hungry he was un he was hungry buffeted and homeless Jesus ever buffeted and homeless buffeted certainly we've seen the movie homeless yeah the guy says I will follow you Jesus and what's Jesus say Son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Working with his, our own hands. Jesus was a hard-working person. Carpenter. Stonemason. When reviled, was Jesus ever reviled? We know how he does this. We know how, where his power comes from. What'd they say? From the power of Satan. Yeah, that's reviling. When you tell God his power comes from Satan, that's pretty much reviling. When, when, uh, when reviled, we bless. Jesus on the cross says of those at the foot of the cross, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. When persecuted, we endure. While on the cross, Jesus said, did not say, never mind, I'm out. Do you think, could he have? Could he have said, you know what? <laughs> no, never mind. They're not worth it. Hurts too much. But he didn't. He endured. When slandered, he entreats. This is the way of Jesus and the way it was worked out in the Apostle Paul's life. And what he is saying is this is the power of the gospel. Is the, the pattern of Christ's life worked out in the life of the individual. It's directional. It has a purpose. It's going a particular way. And it's to make us more like Jesus. Life-changing power is the ways of Jesus. So with the direction set, live like Jesus, Paul now wants to tell the, the Corinthian believers that the wisdom they are seeking doesn't compare with the power of the gospel to transform lives. It just doesn't uh, compare. So life-changing power, verses 14 through 17, if you didn't get it, the ways of Jesus, verses 18 through 20, 
the power of Jesus. 1 Kings 18 uh, is a story where the prophet is invited, uh, the, the prophets of Baal, God's prophet Elijah has invited the prophets of Baal to a uh, competition, a prophetic competition, is what he said. You know the story, right, Mark, Mount Carmel? This is what the prophet said, let two bulls be given to us, let them choose one bull for themselves, cut the pieces, lay it on the wood, no fire. I'll prepare the other bull, lay it on the wood, no fire. That's the terms of the engagement. When you, when you call upon your God, I'll call on my God, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, well, that sounds cool, let's do that. That sounds like fun, okay? So then they do that, the prophets of Baal dance around, nothing happens. Elijah the prophet came to his altar and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then fire of the Lord came, consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Now that's a cool story. Here's the problem. I mean, there's a good thing and a bad thing. Here's the problem. Fire comes down from heaven. As believers, this is the kind of power we want. We want fire from heaven, especially when the guy parks too far over in the parking spot. We want to <laughs> have the fire lick up the car all the way to the tires. Look, spot's open. Pull right in. But what we have to understand, this is the kind of power we all want, fire from heaven. But this power is foreshadowing the real power which is the power of the Christ in the good news of the gospel to change lives. Because look at the li very last verse I read uh, in 1 Kings 18, I think it's uh, 30, or 39. All the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. See, that's the power. It's not the fire. God can make fi fire. We can make fire. Fire is not hard. What is impossible without the power of God? For people to go from worshiping Baal to saying, oh, the Lord, he is God. That's, see, they've had a change of heart, and that requires the power of God to accomplish. And so this whole story is foreshadowing the power of Christ in the gospel to change lies from saying, my life is God, the world is God, my money is God, sex is God, alcohol is God, whatever your thing is, is God, to going, no, 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 the Lord, he is God. And that's the power of the gospel that changes lives. So there might be more appealing ways that we would like to experience the power of God. But the real power of God in the life of the believer is the Holy Spirit working in our hearts to change our lives to be, make us more and more like Jesus. We have to understand the biblical argument is very, very clear. The most miraculous thing you will experience in your life in Christ is for your life to become more like Jesus. That is a, that's a miracle that's happening in real time is when you go from worshiping something else to worshiping Christ more. Verse 18. Some are arrogant. Don't look around. So you've got to be careful when you read verses like this. You read it and you look at somebody and they're, it's not cool. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. So you've got in this church, there's probably a small group of likely wealthy uh, religious elites who are really leading the whole church down this wrong path. And, and the argument they're going to make is Paul would never show up here. It's too humiliating. Because here's what's really happened. Is Paul was good, but now we've realized the Apostle Paul and his cute little gospel was small potatoes. Because now we're accomplishing something, well honestly, something that really matters. I mean, that's great, Paul. You're so precious. But now we're doing something that, that really has some traction to it. And it's making waves in the religious community in the city of Corinth around us. And we've got kind of a name for ourselves now. We, I mean, let's be honest, we kind of matter now. And the Apostle Paul is a has-been. And so they assume Paul would never show up here now because they've moved on past him. This small group of elites assume it would be too humiliating for Paul to show up in their awesome church now. 
And what's happened is they've grown awesome in their own eyes. They've grown kind of incredible in their own eyes. But we can see what the gospel does in Paul for his confidence in verse 19. I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. So a couple of things to really pay attention. It seems like a, this seems like a throwaway verse. It's not, this is critically important. So you've got these elites who are saying, Paul would never, it'd be too humiliating for him to show up here. And, and, and this comes from a, a kind of a machismo. On the playground, it goes like this. Um, you should stick your tongue to that cold fire pole or that cold flagpole. No. What are you? Chicken. <laughs> And now all of a sudden, oh, you're going to call me chicken. And now all of a sudden, we've got to prove ourselves. I'm not chicken. I'm not chicken. But see, they've misunderstood Paul. So they've said Paul would never show up here. And Paul says, no, I would come there. But we might misread that and think, well, Paul is standing. He's, he's, he's silverback gorilla here. Now all of a sudden, he's got to stand up for himself. And he, but look what he says. Oh, I'll come there if the Lord wills. But see, for the arrogant, that seems like a pansy answer. But Paul is saying, I don't need to come to you to prove myself. I don't know. Humiliated. Paul is saying in the gospel, I call that Monday. I live my life humiliated because that's the way of Jesus. And so, I'm, yeah, I'm coming to you, but I'm not worried. I'm going to humiliate it. That's another day of the week for me. I come there and be humiliated. However, see, he hasn't moved off of his stance, which is my confidence is not in me, but it's in the will of God. If God wants me to come to you, I'm going to come to you. If God doesn't want me to come to you, it's not because I'm scared. It's because the Lord has something else for me. You do your thing. And this is, Paul says, I plan to come to you, but just like this, this fool for Jesus, that's what he is, this, this fool for Jesus says, if the Lord wills, what is his plan to do when he shows up? I will find out, not the talk of these arrogant people, he does not care at all what they're thinking about. I will find out their power. How is he going to evaluate whether or not what they're doing has power? Do they look like Jesus? If they don't look like Jesus, they've got no power. Maybe they've got power in the world. Maybe they've got power in influential circles. Maybe they've got lots. Of, they have no power of God because the power of the gospel is directional for a purpose. And he's saying, if, you, if your stuff isn't making you like Jesus, if it isn't transforming you from a rebellion to Jesus follower, it's empty of any useful power. And that's what he's going to do. I want to know if you are becoming like Jesus. What's the answer right now? Well, look at chapter 5. Uh, we'll get there next week. It's actually reported there's sexual immorality among you that even the pagans don't do. So what's the answer going to be? You've got no power. Because you're not living like Jesus. So whatever you're doing may seem great for you, but if it's not making you like Jesus, it's empty of power. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but power. The kingdom of God is the gospel rightly applied to my, my life and the lives of the people around me that I might become more like the ways of Jesus, serving others, humbly serving others, willing to endure hardship, willing to seek the Lord whether, uh, come what may, transforming lives from being dead in my sin to following Jesus where my hope is not in the things of this world, but in the things of his kingdom, which lasts forever. I think Jesus said it this way, if I remember correctly, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom. That's where, where what does Jesus do? What does it look like in my life? Where am I going to find my hope? The kingdom of God. How does that happen? It's the power of the Holy Spirit changing our hearts and our lives. Then he finishes with this in verse 21. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? That's not complicated. Am I going to have to come there and be strong with you in discipline? He's not saying he's going to hit them with a stick. You understand this, right? That's not what he's saying he's going to do. Meaning, am I going to have to come there 
and have strong correctional ministry in your life and explain to you the ways that you have abandoned the power of the gospel to pursue a, a lesser glory? Or are we going to be able to come together in gentleness and, and pursue together the ways of Jesus in our lives? Will they need correction? Or will they simply say, you got, you're right, Paul, we need your help. We need your, your guidance. And this comes down to a heart issue. Correction is for those who want something different from God. Help is for those who want God, but realize it's hard to follow Him. Anybody else find it hard to follow God? Not you guys, all right. That's the first service. Oh, we, we haven't done that yet. No, it's awkward. Life-changing power. The ways of Jesus... Life-changing power is the power of Jesus. So how are, how are we changed? It's the power of the Spirit in our lives to make us like His Son, Jesus Christ. A couple of things before we take communion together. First question. And I know you're going to lie on this one, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Try to be honest, maybe when you get home. Do you want to be impressive, or do you want to be at peace with God? That's, that's what the option the Corinthians are being left with. Do you want to be impressive or do you want to be at peace with God? Now the reality is when most of us come down to church, we are thinking a little bit about our appearance. And that's understandable. It's a context, public setting. You should, you know, put pants on, that sort of thing. <laughs> but the reality is it's so easy in a setting like a local church where we want to give off a certain aura of, a, of having arrived. And, and when we do that, we're making the error of the church. The whole idea is, if I am coming together with the people of God to impress, I'm going to miss the opportunity to pursue the power of God to be transformed. That's what Paul is correcting here. The whole point is to come together, experience the transformative power of God through His Word and the Holy Spirit, where I say, I wasn't like Jesus, and He's made me a little bit more like Jesus. You can't do that if you're impressive because impressive people don't need the power of God. And so it's an honest question we have to answer. Do we want to be impressive or do we want to be at peace with God? To find hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ requires us to realize we're not impressive. We need an impressive Savior. Second thing, miracles. I think all of us like miracles. Don't we like miracles? I think, you know, if somebody posts a, a post online about a miracle in their lives, it's going to get a lot of likes. Ta-da. Thumbs up. Uh, you should be experiencing miraculous power every single day. Now, it's not the kind of stuff you want. But these are the miracles you should be experiencing every day. You should say no to sin you like to do. Right? I'm, there's sins you don't like doing. That's easy. Good for you. Some of you, including me, should say no to sin we enjoy. Why is sin hard to get over? Because it's fun. Have you ever done this? Try this one time. A temptation comes up for you to sin in a way um, that you enjoy. I'm, let me, I'm trying to think of something to be mutually offensive. Um... <laughs> You share a prayer request about somebody, but really it's just gossip. <laughs> you know, you really ought to be praying for so-and-so because they're struggling with because they are financed and their credit is ruined now. It's kind of a gambling thing. Pray for his wife. And it's just a nice way of saying he's got a gambling addiction and it makes me feel better to be able to tell you this guy's a loser because he gambles. Right? And so there's a bit of a... Right? Now, so try this. I know we don't normally do this, but let's try this this week. Are you on board? Let's say no to sin we enjoy. Well, it got quiet there. I was hoping you guys would be more excited about this. <laughs> when you are tempted to do sin and you say no, don't be fooled. You didn't do it. That's a miracle. People don't say no to sin. The Holy Spirit 
empowers you to say no to sin and yes to obedience. That's a miracle of God when a Christ follower begins to turn from sin into obedience. That's a miracle. That's what Paul is saying. The power of God is transformative. When I say, I don't want to do that anymore, I'm going to pursue obedience. Anybody get up and pray for someone else? That's a miracle. That's, that, and maybe we've become used to it. And I know what you're thinking. No, it's self-discipline. I got a list. I got a system. I, I get up and I got this system. Congratulations to the Holy Spirit for giving you a system. It's a miracle that another person would see God's power in the life of another individual. That's a miraculous work of God that he's transforming you from a selfish son of a gun to someone who prays for other people. Now, I know sometimes you pray for others so at the end you can get to your stuff. But that's still a miracle. You get up and read your Bible. That's a miracle that, that God has given you a hunger for his word. Do you, do you take time and serve others in the body of Christ with your gifts? These are all miracles. These are the ways of Jesus in the life of the believer. And we have become numb to the notion that this is the power of God making us like Jesus. Somehow we've, we've been fooled into thinking it's our own self-control and self-discipline. It's not. It's the Holy Spirit doing it. That's G the power of Jesus and it is miraculous. When you see God working himself out in your life, you should thank God because it's a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Finally this, and then we're going to take communion together. To, to find Jesus means we come to a place where we realize our own ways aren't working, that we need his ways. He gives us everything we need to live like him. Last verse, and then we'll take communion. First, Second Peter 1, 3. This uh, explains what I just explained. Now you're going to say, well, why didn't you just read that? It would have saved a lot of time. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How many things in life and godliness has he granted to us? All things. So if you need something to be like Jesus, God has given you by his own generosity all that's needed to be like Jesus. See how that's working? Through the knowledge of him, that is Jesus, who called us to his own glory and excellence. So the second Peter is telling us, you need to be like Jesus. It's for your own benefit. Who is going to give you all you need to be like Jesus? God is. Then you act like Jesus. And what do you say? I did it. That's what we do. We're like a little kid learning to ride the bicycle. I did it. And dad's still running behind holding it. <laughs> I'm doing it, dad. And what's the dad say? Yes, you are. That's what God does. So he gives us all the things to be like Jesus. We act like Jesus and think we did something. I'm going to keep reading the passage. It's not up there. Or I don't know if it was before. Um, I'm going to read. So if you want to follow along, it's uh, what? 2 Peter 1, 4. He has given us all things and called us into his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped corruption in the world because of your sinful desire. So for this reason, make every effort. So do we have to work? Effort is work. Who gives us the power to do the effort? God. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, boo, <laughs> self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a way to have a knowledge of Jesus that is ineffective and unfruitful. It's to know Jesus and not do those things. Life-changing power gives us the ways of Jesus and the power of Jesus, and we experience miracles every single day when we follow him. Uh, why don't we take communion together and I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this through prayer. I mean, I'll invite the worship team to come up so we can close in a song when we're done. Um, I'd open the things up, do the bread first. If... 
you want to do it right. Communion is an act of worship where today I want this to, to make an application from this passage and basically communion is a way that we admit to Jesus, my ways aren't working, I need your ways. My ways don't have power, I want your ways that have transformative power. So when we take communion, remember the gospel of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, the cleansing we have for forgiveness of sins. Here's a couple of things that we may struggle with that are worth seeking the Lord for in repentance as we pray together. Some of us know the gospel of Jesus, but don't live it. We know Jesus, but there is still rampant, unrepentant, known sin in our lives, and we refuse to be done with it. That's a a life in the gospel with zero power. We know the gospel, but don't live it. We refuse to live in obedience, to humbly serve others because of what God has done to serve us. Others of us want the power of the gospel, but we want it for a different purpose. We want Jesus to make us feel better. We want Jesus to fix our family members. We want Jesus to do a whole bunch of things other than make us like Jesus. When we want Jesus' power for a different purpose, it's like trying to steer a Saturn V rocket to a different place than the moon. You don't get at the end of a Saturn V rocket and tell Mission Control, I want to go to Wisconsin. That'd be dumb. You will end up in a hole in the ground. It's got one purpose. And some of us want Jesus' power, but not for its purpose to make us like Jesus. We want Jesus' power to make our life better. It's the wrong purpose. Or we know the power of the gospel and all we do, the only application we make for the gospel is to others in our life. And these are powerless. Worship says, and we want to worship God in communion by saying, I know what my past is. I want my future to be the power of Jesus. So what we're going to do, I want to give you a few moments to pray to think through is the gospel showing up in your life and have an opportunity between you and the Lord to seek repentance and forgiveness and re renewal and restoration of that relationship. And there, there might be specific areas of your life that you want to experience the power of the gospel to change you. And this would be a great opportunity to come before the Lord and say, you know about this in my life, God. I want to be done with that. Or I want to pursue obedience in a way I haven't done before. So let's take a few moments, pray on your own quietly. In just a few min minutes, I will close in prayer. I'll read from a scripture in 1 Corinthians, and then we'll take, partake of communion together. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for being here with us in this moment, and my prayer would be for those of us, God, who are seeing with eyes opened by the Holy Spirit some things in our own heart that we would like you to transform. And God, my prayer would be is that you would build us up in the strength and power of your Holy Spirit. That we would see your strength worked out in us to become more like you. I pr pray for those who are struggling with sin and wonder if they're ever going to be able to beat it and I pray God that you would give us the strength by your spirit to say no and walk away. God I pray for those of us whose eyes have been opened to our lives that are basically centered on ourselves and our own desires and our own interests and God would you give us the power to say yes to humble service and self-sacrifice. 
Jesus, many of us are holding on to resentment and bitterness because of ways in which we've been wronged. And we would pray, God, you'd give us the strength to humbly offer forgiveness and grace. And God, we are thank you for Jesus who did all of these things for us first. Dying on the cross to take the penalty of our sin and rising on the third day that we could experience eternal life forever. We thank you, God, for this bread, which symbolizes Jesus' broken body and the punishment he took on himself that we should have borne. And we thank you for this cup, which symbolizes Jesus' shed blood and the forgiveness we have and the promise you made to us. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's eat and drink together.